Hey, look, it's another printer from Anycubic for me to review. This is the Anycubic Cobra with a K. So we were looking at the Cobra Max before. So I'm assuming this is the same style of printer, just much smaller than the Cobra Max. Okay, piece of foam. Put that over there and my cat will probably jump on it. Um, this looks to be the accessories packet. Oh boy, an SD card, great. Any cubic Cobra assembly instructions. <laughs> oh, the head. Oh, it's a direct drive. That's different for any cubic. See that? The filament loads right there. Yeah, okay, that's different for any cubic. Usually they have a Bowden style extruder. You have been a thorn in my side for far too long, Katatar. I will parade you before the conquered people as the fallen idol of a pathetic ideal. All right, so it's got the, what is it, PEI bed? I guess I can just slap that right on. This looks like a smaller build volume than the Viper. Oh, actually the base of it's quite a bit smaller. Let's pull it out. Anyway, the build platform's a lot smaller. Let's measure it. So the Viper with the PEI bed was about 10 by 10. This one's, well, it's only about an inch smaller. Hmm. I wonder if the goal is just to have a smaller footprint with a similar sized bed to the Viper, because this printer looks a lot smaller than the Viper. Oh, by the way, there's finally a date for MRF, the Midwest Rep Rap Fest. See, they had a fan just for electronics. I kind of want to take a look at the electronics. Haven't done that in a while on these. Well, here's the driver board. I looked up the number on this chip. I couldn't find anything on Google. That's kind of strange. I'm not familiar with the brand. It's like HDSC. I mean, I would hope it's a 32-bit microprocessor. I know they started using those. They used to have the old 8-bits, but they've advanced. And then I wonder if these are still the uh, Trinamic uh, stepper drivers. I guess we'll find out when we hear it running. I guess because of the way it was shipped, the Z-axis is very low, so I actually want you to raise it using by twisting this coupler. As long as I clear the surface, I should be okay. Oh, that's fine. All right, I didn't have to move it too far. Some printers have a big knob up here at the top. I'm kind of surprised this one doesn't have a bushing up here. Um, I'm at a bit of a, bit of a disadvantage because uh, Anycubic sending me these printers ahead of launch, so I actually... <laughs> I can't actually get information on them because they're technically not released yet. So I do not have detailed files. There, I, I did a, a pop culture reference. Quark, we've caught you smuggling these boxes of wood onto Deep Space Nine. What do you have to say for yourself? These are the only replicators I could get after the FCA took my business license. They're made on Earth in Brooklyn in 2012 by a hipster man named Bree Pettis. That's right, and they're completely legal for use in my bar, albeit slow. You know, they should just go ahead and make a Star Trek IV movie with the whales. You know, just continue ripping stuff off, why not? I mean, who cares at this point? What? Stop breaking into here! Oh, the filament holder goes on top of the unit? Oh yeah, they've got some screw bosses here to take it. Well, uh, let's see, the motor's on that side, so this is from the rear. So this needs to go like, well, I'm looking at it from the front, so this needs to go like that. Yeah, all right. Okay, so the whale probe comes back, because technically in the Kelvin timeline, it would come back. Ah, oh, we still got red text with no stroke on a background, so come on, put a stroke around this red text so it's easier to read around these pictures. Okay, so the whale probe comes back and it's like, oh, Starship Enterprise, don't come to Earth. There's a whale probe destroying everything. And then they're like, we must go to the past and find whales again. Here's the twist. You combine it with City on the Edge of Forever. So you have a whale activist in the 1980s named Edith Keeler. And Kirk falls in love with her. And then, of course, it's like, Edith Keeler must die. Well, no, Edith Keeler mustn't die. But they try to save the whales, but they fail and Edith Keeler dies. And they come back to the present. And Kirk is like, the only woman I ever loved is dead because of what 
I did. And then Scotty's like, Captain! Oh wait, it wouldn't be Scotty, it would be Uhura. Captain, we are receiving whale song. How? We failed to save the whales. And then uh, Spock would be like, the historical records have changed. Edith Keeler became a martyr for the whale cause. Her death caused the whales to live. And then everything's fine. But of course, if it's a new Trek, there has to be a bunch of punching and fighting and stupidity. Oh, that was so dumb in Star Trek Into Darkness. The cold fusion reaction will render the volcano inert. That's not how science works. Oh, pfft, like they care. Cold fusion reaction, give me a break. All right, so apparently this holds the cable. Make sure it has enough slack. It looks like it will. And then J.J. Abrams would be like, we swear this new Star Trek movie does not involve whales. And then it involves whales. This part here where the uh, x-axis motor cable comes in, oh, it seems a little flimsy, I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll bring it up to its height and then we'll see if it... This kind of comes off to the side. I like how it's got a smaller footprint except for this cable flopping around in the breeze, but maybe... I like everything being in a nice square. Oh, gotta make sure we switch it to America volts. That's weird. I don't think China uses 230. I wonder why it always defaults to 230. They expect these to all go to Europe. Oh, this is different. It has an inductive sensor, kind of like the Prusa's. The last couple I looked at had a force sensor on the nozzle. It's the Anycubic theme song. I don't say menu as before. Before leveling, use a metal tool such as the included wrench to touch, touch the proximity switch and the indicator will light. Oh, I guess, well, technically you need something that's ferrous. Okay. All right, so the sensor is working. That's good. Okay, prepare, leveling, auto leveling. Okay, prepare, leveling, auto leveling. The probing will start. Please confirm to continue. The probing will continue until morale improves. So it's going to use this steel magnetic plate as reference, so it won't actually touch all the way. See how it gets a certain distance? And then it's going to check the distance. It doesn't say to put filament in, so I'm just going to let it do whatever it wants, I guess. This printer head looks completely different from the other Anycubic offerings I've looked at. Well, a lot of it is because it's a direct drive. This must be the tensioner wheel. Um, oh yeah, you can see, see the gear right there. Well, that's good. See, this would be better if you're doing like a flexible filament, like a TPU, this printer would be a better choice than say this printer. Because if you have the, um, the grip point here, the TPU has to go through this whole tube before it extrudes and it could, well, it could compress upon itself. So a direct drive printer like, like this one is going to be better for certain materials. So that's a bonus. Speaking of replicators, I still use my Replicator 1 and it still works, although right now it's holding the parts from my MGC workshop. And I actually mostly use it for TPU, like this right here, because it's got a pretty short distance between the, the drive gear and the hot end. So it actually, it's good for TPU because of that. Also, this printer is slow, so printing, you have to print TPU slow as well. So the slow printer isn't really a negative when you're printing TPU. And these are the original extruders. I don't know how they still work. Actually, this printer is going to turn 10 years old in September. I should have a party for it. Just another, what, 300 years and then it'll be old enough for Quark to buy? The bed actually heated up pretty fast. I assume the reason it heats up the bed and does then does the multiple probing is so it takes any expansion of the steel into account. Although I think this is actually aluminum, so it's probably well, there's a PCB, which actually has the heater on it, the traces. Then aluminum, I believe, then a steel layer, and then the removable uh, PEI layer. Is it PEI? PEI, which is short for polyethylamide. As with the other Anycubic printers, you've got to make sure you want to hold on to this SD card because they're going to have the profiles for the printer and an installation of Cure that you can use to slice the prints. Um, again, these are brand new printers, so the only way for me to get the profiles is with this card. Okay, this part is different. It created a reference plane with all those probes, so it creates a 3D mesh in memory of the actual height of the bed. This, of course, is never gonna be completely flat. But you also have to manually squish a piece of paper. I like to use this piece of tape when I do this. So this is kind of like old school, this part. So we're gonna... It's like going away or towards it? It's moving, I can barely, oh, okay, it is going down, okay. We want a little bit of resistance, but not too much. Let me go up a little bit. 
Looks like I had offset by 0.9 millimeters. So the probing it just did tells it the mesh relative from the surface to the probe. But unlike the other printers that used a pressure sensor on the nozzle, then you still have to manually dial in the distance between the bed and the and the nozzle. Well, technically you're dialing in the difference between the sensor range and the tip of the nozzle. This kind of looks like a transformer. More than meets the eye. Okay, filament loading I'm assuming is pretty much the same as before. I'm gonna put the filament on the spool. I like how the filament's coming straight down into it. That's good. All right, so if I, I assume if I pull this, it opens up the teeth. Uh, oh, wow, that's pretty tight. Because you know me, I usually like to just cram it in there and cram it right up to the nozzle. I might have to actually have to use, okay, I'm gonna go to tools. Oh wait, prepare, prepare, filament, filament in. Okay, it's raising the temperature. Normally I like to just cram it in, but again, since this is unknown, I'm gonna have to do it the right way. I'm gonna tap filament in. So the grip wheel is pretty tight, so I had to actually, even though it's running, I had to pull it out a little bit. And okay, oh, now we're getting an extrusion, here we go. Okay, so they must have tested it with, oh, that's kind of painful. They must have tested it with white filament. Okay, well, I guess we're ready to try a print. I will do the usual <laughs> Kira stuff. I'll get the, get the profiles figured out. I think it was the, uh, actually the, the last couple, the Anycubic Viper, I wasn't able to get connected via USB to Simplify 3D. Although Simplify 3D has not been maintain maintained very well, unfortunately. So far, that box is keeping Bud busy. All right, so yes, the SD card had a PDF file that had the setup instructions as well as getting started with Cura. I've covered that in other videos. I would just say read the PDF. It tells you how, you know, you install Cura, then you make a custom profile, you import the suggested parameters which are included with the SD card. And uh, yeah, still seems a little slow. It seems like the default speed is 60 millimeters a second, which I don't think it's that fast, honestly, but I guess I could try cranking it up. All right, so I'm gonna print something that I often use for my uh, accessibility controllers, an analog cap, and I think gray is a fine color. Let's see how it turns out. It says it's gonna take 24 minutes. All right, looks like it's going in for the Z. So it probably is going to double check the Z distance at the center of the table, and then it will compare that to the other Z mesh values it took around the table. I'm just assuming that's how it works, but why wouldn't it work that way? Is this be the first adhesion test? It looks like it's printing a skirt. Looks like the adhesion might be, I think I probably should have squished that paper a little bit more when I did the test. The first layer should be a little bit more squished than that. I mean, it seems like it's sticking okay, but then for a larger project, you probably want a little bit more compression on your first layer to ensure that it sticks. Although this, this PEI bed does do a good job of holding things in general because it has a texture which increases the surface area. I think the uh, Cura time estimate might be off. We're at uh, 13 minutes elapsed and we're only about five millimeters high. Yeah, 24 minutes is about what this would take on my super fast uh, fl flash forgery. Of course, this is only running 60 millimeters a second. I probably could bump it up. But let's just let this finish. We'll take a look at the quality of the print and then we'll uh, try some other things. Bud, are you watching the print for me? Be careful, it's hot. Show them your stylish new collar. Look at that. Yeah, stylish. Okay, that took 35 minutes instead of 24. That was at 60 millimeters a second speed. It should come off pretty easy because of the PEI bed, yep. Yeah, you can see the, Z, the first layer Z. Yeah, that should be more compressed than that. See how you can see the infill? This should look like a flat surface. So I'm gonna adjust that for the next print. And yeah, the layer, the layer's a little inconsistent. It could be because of the first layer I'm being a little off. You can kind of, kind of looks like a, a planet, like, like, like Saturn or something. Okay, so prepare leveling Z offset. I think it should be tighter, so I think I want this to be lower. Needs to go up for, yeah. I'll go a full millimeter. Yeah, now the first layer is a little bit more squished. Okay, well, what I'm doing here is I'm just basically testing the mesh level to make sure all four corners are equally level. See the, the mushing on the outside? 
at the corner. So I went from 0.9 millimeter to one millimeter offset. I might adjust that back to 0.95. This first layer was definitely undercooked. You shouldn't see those styrations in there. It should just appear as a flat texture from this bed. Uh-oh, this gray filament that I have, it snapped. Let's try a hot swap. Pause. Okay, lift it up. That's good. What was that beep? It sounds like a video game, like like when Sonic's drowning. All right, let's try resuming. Did it take the filament? The wheel's turning. Wheel in the sky keeps on turning. Don't know where I'll be tomorrow. Actually, I'll probably be here. Oh, it's not extruding. Oh, there we go. There I got past it. All right, resume. Okay, so to open up the throat of the 3D printer filament, you have to squeeze pretty hard. But that's good because it means it's gripping it pretty hard. And now you can see my furnace. Hashtag furnace doxing. Yeah, see where it stopped right there? Well, it's not like I'm Kim Kardashian or anything. I don't really have to worry about someone doxing my furnace. What would you even do with that information? Let's try that again. Pause. Oh no, the filament's broken. Disaster, okay. Open it up, pull the filament out. The filament, put it into the tube, open the throat really wide. Push it down, extrude, get the excess and resume. That's not too bad. Oh, check this out. I found this at Goodwill. This could be like a Tecmoan episode. It's like a cassette player that converts to MP3 and it does it like with USB on the go. So somehow you hook a USB thumb drive into this and then you play your tapes and it converts them. This should be interesting. Yeah, that'll be a future video. So that last hot swap I did, I can kind of see a little uh, nick there. But uh, it's pretty imperceivable. Transformers, more than meets the eye. Take the matrix of leadership. Okay, let's see. Tools, move axis, uh, Y plus, okay. What, that's not 10 millimeters. I may be an American, but I know what 10 millimeters is. Well, that's nice that software stopped itself. It didn't go clunk. All right, let's Definitely adhered well. Probably a little too well. I should probably adjust that Z back down to 0.95 instead of one. Oh, there we go. Okay. You can still kind of see the infill. See like right there? You can see the cross pattern. Here you can't. So I'm wondering if one side of the bed isn't quite as level. Like you could actually print something and have this be the leading surface of whatever you're printing and then you get a free texture out of it. I'm gonna run this again. I'm gonna adjust the Z to 0.95 and then we'll compare. Oh, sorry, I was gone for a while. I found out about this fish fry that was at a church down the road. Actually not too far from here. I think because it's Lent, so I got some fish, it was pretty good. Then I donated money to stop starving orphans or something. Okay, well that fell, that fell right off because of the bed. Actually, yeah, if you look here, well, can you see that? Why do I always say that? So you can see more of the cross pattern there. That's your fake, you can tell by the cross section. So this was a slightly less, less squished version. 
Yeah, you can definitely tell. So the one on the left was the one millimeter gap. So see how the one on the left has less pronounced first layer? Uh, well, styrations isn't the right word, but I think I might go back to the other the setting of one millimeter offset because I like how it has more adhesion. Even though it, I, at first glance it looked a little squished, but I think that's probably for the better. I'm printing a 3D Benchy, that ship thing right now, and there's some text at the bottom of the ship. So whether or not the text stays legible after the whole thing prints is one of the many tests that the Benchy helps with. It lets you know how your first layer adhesion is. Obviously you need good adhesion, but not so much that you lose detail in the lower layers. So that's what that part of the test shows. So we'll see if, I think it says 3D Benchy. It says something. I am printing this at 0.1 millimeter layer height, so it should be pretty high quality. Print time, two hours, 48 minutes. Okay, I think Cura said two hours, seven minutes, so that's a bit high. It should just fall right off since it's cold. Yep. All right, let's take a closer look. Okay, first on the bottom, there's the text. This is the 0.95 millimeter, millimeter offset. So I don't really see any um, cross patterns in the bottom, which is good. We just see the texture of the build or the PEI build platform. Text is readable. Maybe it looks a little deeper on the right hand side, the XYZ. In the back, okay, we've got our little spigot or whatever. Is, is this a jet ski? Is this how this thing works? Does it have an impeller? Do you see some deviations here in color? Um, but the print itself is pretty smooth. The overhang of this lip here looks pretty good. I don't know what this part of a ship is called. This was done with obviously no supports. There's a little bit of a burr under it, not too bad. Okay, so there's an overhang there for the front window. Droops a little bit. Doesn't look too bad. Same thing here. Remember, this is meant to torture your printer. And it's a cute little ship. Oh look, there's a steering wheel inside the ship. Great. So right here we've got a little bit of a, a zit hanging off. Of course there's no support for that, so that really shouldn't be there. But Not a big deal. A little bit of overhang in the rear window, your favorite Hitchcock movie. How's the box look? Box is nice and clean. The flag holder looks pretty good. There is, <clears throat> there's a little bit of a line here, see that? Right there, about uh, nine millimeters up. Smokestack looks good. Oh yeah, you can actually see the, um, the stair stepping of the layers. So, well, again, this thing is, there's actually measurements posted for this online, so you can check everything. I'm sure the dimensional accuracy is fine. But yeah, you can see how the slope is created by successive layers. Stair stepping right there. Now you don't see that on the deck because the deck is just flat, it's not angled, but you can see it here in the bow. Yeah, I would say my main issue with this is this doesn't seem like it should have taken nearly three hours to print. I'm going to see if I can up the speed and see if we can get it down to like under two hours. Are you going to guard this print for me, bud? Are you a cat? Uh-oh, you can dox bud. Nice bud. Nice bud. All right, here's another Benchy. This one, well, I allegedly printed it at 120 millimeters a second. However, I think there's some sort of firmware limiter on the printer because this only took about half an hour less than this one at 60. Print quality is pretty much the same. That's interesting. <laughs> Can you see that? See like how there's like kind of like some dark areas there and there on both models? So it must have more to do with the slicing than like a filament aberration. It's not going to be the fastest printer. It's not the fastest printer I have. As I mentioned, I have a printer that I, with custom firmware, well not custom, it's just custom configured Marlin. I crank one of mine at like 120. The quality isn't super great, but man, the throughput is fast. Uh, yeah, but I would say overall these benches look uh, pretty good. I would say the only real issue is probably the overhang here, but again, this is meant to test that. But are you trying to get into my secret garden? Don't think twice. So this is a flexible filament. Um, TPU, uh, one common brand name is Ninja Flex. 
But with a Bowden tube, like uh, you have the other Anycubic printers we're using, you wouldn't have a direct drive of it. Since it's so flexible, making a direct drive through a long tube might not necessarily work. Okay, it's pulling it through. Okay, now it's extruding. All right, I've got a TPU file on the card. It's gonna print at 15 millimeters a second, which is obviously quite slow. However, you have to do it that way for TPU. There was a TPU preset in Cura, but I had to manually lower the speed quite a bit. I use TPU when I'm making my accessibility controllers uh, for some of the buttons, just because TPU will not crack or break like PLA with with time. All right, so we'll see how this turns out. Okay, it looks like we have pretty good adhesion on the skirt. That's the outline that it prints around the part to make sure that the, the nozzle's primed. And now it's doing the insides. Again, this is quite slow. If you're thinking about doing uh, TPU, flexible filament, I think that uh, any cubic Cobra, just the standard Cobra, would probably be your best bet of all the any cubics I've looked at because it's the only one I've seen where it has a direct drive instead of a Bowden tube. So you've got the driver motor here, so the pressure on the filament is right here, and then it's pressed or pushed through this tube. However, if you have a flexible filament, the friction in this tube might cause issues. It might kind of bunch up. It might, you know, waver around. So for flexible filament, it's best, best to have the shortest distance possible between the drive gear and the hot end extruder. So a printer like this wouldn't do as well with TPU. But this Anycubic, the Cobra, should do a good job with TPU. Now that's not to say that the other Bowden tube printers wouldn't work with TPU. I'm saying this one would give you the best, most consistent results. And you'd have a lower chance of uh, filament feed errors. All right, let's take a look at this. This is printed at 0.2 millimeter layer height. See how it's flexible? Yeah, that texture that leaves on the bottom is cool. First layer adhesion seems pretty good. Here's the piece this is meant to interface with. What this does on my, my custom controllers is this moves, well, yeah, let me just show you. Xbox controller and you want to make it left-handed, you need to move these face buttons over here. So this is designed to fit in the hole left behind when you remove the D-pad. D-pad is circular on the new Xbox core controllers. Let's see how this interfaces. It's a little tight. Um, what I often do is I actually hit the edges. The thing that usually makes it tight are these pieces between the four buttons that hold it together. Yeah, seems to fit pretty good. All right, I'm actually going to print more of those because I need them. And I also want to see how it does with multiple parts with TPU as far as the stringing goes. Because it is, is it, a ver it is a very stringy material because it's flexible. All right, they appear to have printed without any major stringing between the parts. Like, you know, if there's, well, there's a little bit. See that right there? A little bit of string. Sometimes, well, especially if you're printing like with the TPU, you might want to just print one at a time. That way the head doesn't have to move around too much. Because when the head moves between five different parts, you have a greater chance of it stringing out and causing issues. All right, so this printer did a perfectly fine job. Uh, yeah, okay, so with the direct drive extruder, you can definitely do TPU on this printer. This is a 120 millimeters a second, allegedly. Uh, let's see how the print quality turns out. This is gonna be fine print quality, 0.1 millimeter. Bud, did you know that according to my calendar that I got from the city, it's International Respect Your Cat Day. So I guess I should respect you? Bud, where'd your collar go? What'd you do to your collar? Did you lose your collar? You took off your collar. If you get lost, you'll never be found without a collar. Well, you have a microchip. Okay. Moved easily. Nice texture on the back. Infill looks pretty good. Layers, well, it's 0.1 millimeters, so you're not really gonna see any layers, at least not with the human eye. Yeah, that turned out pretty well. Okay, it estimated 12, it took 17. Although some of that was probably the hot end heating up. Not too bad. I'm gonna print a slightly larger thing. Uh, this is an analog cap cover that I use for my single-headed controllers. All right, I'm printing a larger object now. Uh, I'm printing this at 0.2 millimeter layer height. Still trying to do it as fast as possible as far as the XY travel speed. All right, this is with Cura. 
something's changed with the Z level. I think I need to adjust it. It's not sticking super great. Okay, this one was printed over USB using um, Cura. Let's take a look. It's still not adhering as well as I would like it to. I bumped it up to negative 1.2 millimeters. Maybe I need to go a little bit further. Okay, I don't see too many of those zits. This is a 0.2 millimeter height print. I did download the Prusa slicer. Maybe we could give that a try. I gotta say, I do not like this trend of some software that doesn't even want to print over USB. It's like, oh, you should be using OctoPrint instead. Well, OctoPrint just means you've got a Raspberry Pi hooked up to your printer and that's going over USB. And Raspberry Pis are hard to find nowadays. And I just don't, I just think it's inconvenient. Like, oh, every time I want to do a print, I have to pull out this little card, not drop it, stick it in my computer, then stick it back in here. Granted, that's the slicer software, not the printer, but I'm just kind of ranting. Like, printing over USB is useful. Okay, this is the Prusa slicer. Very cold turkey. All it knows is the bed size, the nozzle diameter, the filament diameter, and I think that's it. <laughs> so I'm printing uh, that ring again. Let's just see how it turns out. My main issue with Kira is it captures every USB port. So if I turn on another one of my printers while Kira is running, Kira captures that port as well. So if I try to connect to it using um, Simplify 3D, I can't. Now that would be great if everything I was doing was with Kira, but it isn't, so I kind of consider that a negative. Um, so yeah, I, I was having some adhesion issues, so that is definitely one thing different about this printer versus the last few Anycubics, is it's using an inductive sensor instead of a pressure sensor on the nozzle itself. So after you do your initial Z, then you have to go into um, prepare and leveling and then manually do the offset. Uh, same thing happens on my Flash Forgery uh, custom 3D printer. I have to set in firmware the Z offset between the BL touch and the nozzle. So the BL touch pops out like this. So the offset is the distance between the height which causes that to click in and the nozzle. It's about one and a half millimeters as well. And I actually had to dial it in pretty well or pre pretty carefully to make it work with glass. So that's what you're looking at. Again, versus the other Anycubics I've been reviewing lately where there's a pressure sensor on the nozzle itself, which is used for Z, in which case you don't have to add the offset unless you're having trouble making it stick. But in the case of the Anycubic Cobra, you definitely have to dial in that offset manually after your initial setup. Okay, here's a ring that was streamed from Kira over USB to the printer. Looks like it printed pretty well. Although if you look at the first layer, see how there's a lot of compression? And um, like right here on this, on the skirt that it printed, you can see a rough edge. See that rough edge right there? We can see the plastic almost kind of like squeezing out of the textured build platform. To me, it seems like now it's there's it's too low or too close to the Z, squishing it a lot. See, you've got a little bit of an elephant's foot at the bottom. See how it's it's supposed to be flat, but you've got a little it's squished out a little bit. I mean, that's not the end of the world, and yeah, you have to have that to some extent. But I think I've gone too far. Like, yeah, this is yeah. Look look at those. See those serrations on the inside. That tells me that I went too far. So what I'll do sometimes when I'm designing stuff is the surface that I, well, cause when I design stuff, I design it with the print surface in mind. Cause you always have to have a print, a flat print surface. I'll put like a chamfer or a fillet on the bottom to kind of hide any elephant's foot. Actually, let's try that. It's a very small fillet. Wait, it's not a fillet, it's a chamfer. And I say fillet because if I say fillet, then it sounds like a fish. Like, I'm going to fillet a fish so I can have a fillet of fish, and then I'm going to fillet something so it has a rounded edge. Kind of like, what route should we take to go to the party? Because I route things on my CNC machine, but I almost never talk about roots in the ground. Okay, anyway, that uh, tangent aside. Yeah, the fillet's quite small. You can probably barely see it. But what you can probably see is that there's no ungainly elephant foot. I guess we'll just see if this actually continues to stick. And I made the walls kind of thin on this one to make it more susceptible to lifting. Oh, look, a ring. 
the printer forged twelve rings given to men who above all else desire power. Okay, let's go with the pros and cons of this printer. So the first pro, like all the Anycubic printers, uh, very easy assembly. It's basically just in two pieces. The main issue might be keeping the main, you know, A-frame straight as you put in the screws. It's, you know, it's good if you have someone there to help you with it. Just keep everything straight. The, the PEI bed, uh, I really like these beds. I find them very useful on the other printers that I've seen them on. It gives you a really cool texture. And then once the bed goes cold, the part just pops right off, which isn't the case with the glass beds and glue sticks as I use for, with some of my other printers. Speaking of the bed, you have the inductive Z sensor, which you see in a lot of the Prusa printers. That's pretty nice. It, uh, you know, it's, well, it's a no touch sensor, you know. The, uh, the, nozzle, the nozzle pressure sensors that I saw on the other Anycubics, those worked well. Although I like it when, you know, basically there's, it's not touching, you know, it's done with science. Because the one thing I get concerned about when you're having a nozzle pressure sensor is, you know, if there's some plastic on the end, end of the nozzle, does that affect the Z position? And then also speaking of the bed, uh, the printer has a fairly compact XY footprint, but it actually has a pretty decent sized bed in comparison to its footprint. As I mentioned, the bed is only about an inch shorter on each XY axis versus the Anycubic Viper, although the footprint of the Cobra is much smaller than the Viper. And now for the cons. Okay, so loading the extruder. I like how this uses a direct drive extruder. I just thought it was maybe not necessarily lined up as well as it could be. Like when you when you pull the, the tensioner, the, the, the feeder moves with it, the feeder that has like the little PTFE tube on it. And I, I had a little bit of trouble getting that lined up to then go into the toothed gear and then go into the extruder. Now, obviously, you know, with time, I would I would know the nuances of the machine. But just off the bat, that was a little iffy for me. I just think it, it takes some practice to make sure you're manually loading the filament correctly. Okay, so the Z-bed offset adjustment. I would say this was the biggest issue I had with the printer. So on paper, an inductive sensor like this one has is an improvement. However... When you're setting up the printer and dialing it in, you're going to need to take extra care with your Z-bed offset adjustment. So you can't just do the initial Z and expect it to work. You have to say, oh, now I have to adjust the difference between the inductive zero and the actual nozzle itself. So in my case, that was somewhere around negative 0.95 to negative 0.125 millimeters. Not all your parts will have the same adhesion properties. Obviously, if you're printing something, a large flat thing, it's going to have tons of surface area, so it's going to stick no matter what. A setting that might work for that isn't going to work with a small ring, as you saw me print a couple of, because those have very little surface area. You're definitely going to need to make sure you take the time to get your Z-bed offset adjustment correct. And then finally, okay, this is a really minor nitpick, but it had a micro SD card in it. Why? This is not a cell phone. This is not a camera that fits in your eyeball. Why can't we have a full-size SD card? Because if I'm pulling the card out of this and sticking it into my computer because, you know, these most of these modern programs don't even want me to use USB, why can't I have a full-size SD card so it's just easier to handle? I know that sounds like an old man issue, but I would prefer to have a full-size SD card. I mean, why not? Okay, well, that was my review of the Anycubic Cobra. It's one of their new printers. I would say this is probably a better general purpose bet than the Anycubic Cobra Max that I just uh, reviewed. For one thing, it's like half the price. I believe it's around $2.99 when you buy it direct from Anycubic. The build platform is almost as big as the Anycubic Viper that I reviewed like four or five months ago. However, the printer itself takes up less space. It's more compact, like you don't have the filament uh, hanging off here to the side, you know, and taking up more space. Like this is a smaller footprint on your table, which I think is a good thing. So I would say like if I was choosing between this and the Anycubic Viper, I would probably go with this. Also because you have the direct drive system, which is gonna give you more options with what kind of filaments you can load in. So yeah, um, I, would, I would say this would be a great starter printer for someone. Uh, the price is really good. It was really easy to set up and you get this really handy TPI bed, even though you have to make sure you get the Z dialed in. All right, well, we'll see you in the next video.